here if you need me. All right, guys, we are live for 2023 goal setting. And uh, I want to thank so many people for coming on tonight. We are having a little bit of t technical difficulty getting our 17-time Grand Slam champion, Mark Woodford, on. He's trying very, very hard. He's such a cool guy. He's trying very hard behind the scenes, just so you guys know. Uh, right here over to the side, which we'll be bringing them in, so we'll be blowing up these beautiful faces besides us. But we have uh, the legend Steve Cattardi below me uh, to the uh, to the right side there. And then nice. we Berman, and we, we went to – you see, we all got our Paris shirts on tonight, which is going to be part of the goal set. And you want to make a goal to come to Paris next year with us and train with Mark Woodford and Steve and Guy. How are you boys doing tonight? Very good. How are you doing? Good, thank you. We're, we're doing good, except we're just a little stressed that, uh, you know, the legend Mark Woodford's having trouble getting on. But he is trying right now, just so you know, guys, behind the scenes. Um, he's trying to get on. I just want to acknowledge the people who are on saying hello. Uh, we have Rich saying hello, Peter and Mark, listening from San Francisco Bay Area tonight. I used to be a director of tennis at um, Almond Valley Athletic Club in San Jose. Steve, you know every club in the world. Do you know that club? I, I think we played a tournament there once with my son, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually played that same tournament. When I went in for a job interview, I remember the T-shirt I got for playing the tournament, and I thought, oh, this is a good sign, and I did <laughs> get the job. So that was pretty good. Mark that was is asking for the link, so I'm going to resend them the link here. Uh, so we're doing some major multitasking right now, guys. We do apologize. Um, but, uh, Steve, could maybe I'm going to bring you guys in a little closer here. All right. And... Let's see here. We'll get everybody in. Okay. Okay. Steve, as I send Mark the link, you have been a coach forever. What do you like to tell people to do this time of year to get ready for next year? What, what are some of the things you like to do to get your troops up? Uh, their minds right and focused? Well, I think, uh, number one, uh, let's identify the things that we need to improve on, the things that have let us down in uh, the past year of competition. Uh, identify those and then uh, really, really concentrate on uh, work, working on, uh, on on those fundamentals so that we can, uh, we can come out of the box when we're ready for competition in the spring and be a little bit sharper there. So identify what, we, what the problems were and uh, identify a, a, uh, a progression in a program where we can work on those. And uh, by the time, by time it's ready to serve them up and keep score again, we're, uh, we're, we're pretty well brushed up on, uh, on the uh, problems we've had. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Um, what about you, Guy? Guy? Guy, if you guys don't know, a fantastic player. What a big power forehand and a drop shot. Uh, you, a great player, great coach. What? How do you like to um, kind of get your people focused for the next year? No, well, I was going to talk about my uh, my experience in the U.S. as a as a student athlete, and uh, and basically on the during this time of the season. Uh, October, November, and December, we 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 mainly work on on conditioning and uh, and correcting a couple of uh, of technical points on a, on the tennis uh, with the coach. Uh, work a lot on on a, on the strategy and uh, on the tactic. We 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 work also on the on matching uh, which player we're gonna play with in doubles for the for the spring uh, for the spring uh, tournaments and uh, NCAA conference. So yeah, that's pretty much. I'm just talking about the the, the college experience. But yeah, as 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 Steve said, um, with my student, I work a lot on on many things actually, technical matches and uh, all kind of things because you know the 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 the, the competition uh, in France uh, is is going all year round and uh, and I have all kind of of requests from kids to to adults. So it's really it really vary on on what what their goal is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would add, I would also add one other thing, Peter, which uh, uh, I, I think the off season is a time to work on a little strength as well. Uh, you know, where where did we uh, fall down in terms of our strength? Was it our upper body? Was it our core? Was it our legs? Uh, so this is a good time to do some uh, specific strength training as well. Yeah, absolutely. And speed training. 
Well, I am still in multitask mode, which I am not the best at. And I am trying to send Mark his link. All right, so got it copied. All right, just hold on with me real quick. One, one second, guys, while I send Mark the link again. Okay, I've done that. How many people do we have? Do we have uh, following Peter? Are they all from uh, the U.S.? Everybody's from the U.S. Well, anyone we from Europe? Have people from kind of all over. It looks like right now we have 82 people on. That's good. Good audience. And uh, I want to thank you guys for coming on. I want to thank you for your patience. And just, just so you know, right there, look at that. Oh, Japan. Japan. All right. Great to be back. Thanks for doing this. Uh, whether we get Mark on or not, I promise we're going to make this a good. A good call for everybody. I got a lot of good ideas on also how to uh, goal set. Um, but before we get into goal setting, uh, the reason why we're going to have Mark Woodford on tonight, the reason why I have Guy and, and Steve here is, uh, you know, we obviously want to get better at tennis, but the biggest motivator for me right now, what do I really want out of tennis? What's my why? It's experiences. And I had the best experience of my, the best week ever going spending time with these guys with our tennis uh, Paris experience that we had, which was which was fantastic. And, and Guy organized it with Steve. And uh, we're going to invite you guys to come to, to this at the end of tonight's call before we go through our coaching. But why we're kind of way on Mark, um, Steve and Gee, tell us how this whole thing got started and, and how Mark Woodford got involved and, and all that kind of great stuff. Well, um, I think many of you know, um, you know, we've been doing our tennis fantasy program for about 35 years now. And uh, I had met Gee very briefly when he was a student uh, athlete over here in the Cincinnati area, Northern Kentucky. So uh, three years ago, Gee called me with, uh, with an idea to take some people to, uh, to, to France and we massaged it a little bit. And uh, I said, well, I do want to take some people to France, but uh, I want to play at Roland Garros. And um, I thought it was an impossible hurdle to get over, but uh, Guy weaved, weaved his magic and I uh, called back in a couple of weeks and said, uh, we're in. So uh, we put the trip together last year. And um, of course we wanted in keeping with our idea of tennis fantasies with the legends. We wanted a legend and we wanted a legend that has won uh, uh, all the marbles at the French Open. And, uh, and Mark Woodford, of course, filled that bill perfectly. Uh, so Mark joined us uh, along with uh, a couple of other US pros. And of course, we used the pros from the uh, French Tennis Federation when we were playing at Roland Garros as well. So he put together a fabulous trip playing at Roland Garros, taking the uh, River cruise, uh, dinner cruise down the, down the river, watching the uh, fireworks under the Bas uh, under the Eiffel Tower on Bastille Day, uh, and then more to come when we uh, jumped on the on the fast train to go down to Leon and played at the beautiful club in Leon and did some uh, some uh, area specialties uh, tour of the uh, the old city and then uh, a tour of the vineyard, uh, you know, capping it with uh, with a beautiful dinner at the at the vineyard as well. So it was a, it was a real. Uh, a real uh, fairy tale trip, and uh, you know, Guy put it together beautifully, and we had uh, 38 people who all went away uh, smiling. So, uh, great trip. Uh, again, keeping in line with our tennis fantasies with the legends, having legend Mark Woodford, who was just absolutely perfect for the uh, for the event. Yeah, and it really was. Of course, left handed Peter over there as well. So, yeah, yeah. his court was was, uh, was always active. So guys, we're gonna do this. I'm calling Mark Woodford right now, so we can, so Mark can at least say hi to you guys. I'm sure he'll come back another time, but he's having trouble with his browser. Um, he's also feeling a little under the weather, so maybe it's not the worst thing. Mark, are you there? Okay, I don't know if people can hear. Can you? I know you're not feeling very good, but um, can you just speak up a little bit and say hello to everybody and, and that we'll, we'll try another time with you? Uh, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, hopefully people can maybe hear uh, on the phone as well. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I, I have not had any success in uh, logging on to the link and I'm really distraught because uh, uh, I, I had uh, lots of great information to help some of the listeners, um, you, you know, in regards to, 
uh, doubles and uh, preparation and, and, of course, leading into a great fantasy camp that we hold uh, in Paris um, next year. Yeah. Well, we would have loved to have you on. Mark, we'll, we'll try another time, and, and uh, we're going to do the, the best we can uh, without, without you, the legend, the 17-time Grand Sam champion. So we won't be as good, but, but we're going to try and help these people, and, and we appreciate you trying so hard to get on, and, and we'll make it work another time. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be checking. I know that we had, a, uh, I think, an hour set aside, so I'm going to continue frantically seeing if I can uh, I get my, can my laptop or my uh, iPad or even on my phone to see if I can get this operating. So uh, I'm not going to give up hope because perseverance, that's part of uh, a tennis player's DNA, right? <laughs> you that, you're, get, get your 13-year-old neighbor to come over and help you. <laughs> well, you, you're awesome, Mark. Okay, well, we'll, we'll try our best. You try your best. And either way, we, we thank you for your efforts. Okay. Thank you, thank you buddy. All right. Guys, I, I apologize. That's, that is the tech world. Um, it, 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 I was actually having trouble getting on myself. I got on the last second. I don't, I don't even know what the issue is. Lots of times that's the problem. You don't even know what, what you can do different. So Mark's over there struggling. We appreciate you guys still staying on. Um, and I'm going to go in to now kind of lean this game. It's a little more organized and, and let's really get into some goal setting. And, and so, uh, I want people to get, get a notepad out because I really believe that if you go through these steps, you can really, uh, be a better player at the end of 2023 if you, if you go through these steps. So now we are going to get into some real coaching and I hope, hope you guys, uh, really enjoy it. I'm going to move these gentlemen to the side. We'll bring them in and out. Uh, but the first thing I want everybody to write down is what is your why? What is your big why? Because I find that tennis is such a complicated game and we tend to want it all. We, we want to hit better serves. We want to hit better forehands, volleys. We want our fitness to be better and we want to win matches and we want our technique to improve. And it can become so overwhelming that most of the time at the, especially when season starts to happen, then all you want to do is win. You know, you, you claim you want to do all the other stuff, but once you're out there on the court, I don't care who you are. You want to win that match. That becomes quickly the most important thing. Even if you claim technique is, is your most important thing that you want to change. Um, but if you know your why, why are you playing the game? What is your big why? What do you most want to get out of it at this point in your life? then that can kind of help you construct a and put things into a bite-sized chunks to where you can actually accomplish some great things. Uh, like, for example, I know many of you, your, your why is to go out there and, and win league matches. That, that might be a big why. You want to go out there and win your 3-5 league. My why is different. My why is I love to coach and I still love to hit the ball. So, my why is I want to be able to go out there and hit with anybody, but my body, I know I can't play with everybody. So, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily improve like my single strategy and all that. I want my fitness to improve. I still want to be able to go out there and hit with Guy and Guy not laugh at me. So let's go around the horn. I'm going to write, the, I have told you my why. My why is to just love to go out there, bang balls, hit cross courts, still look good making videos for you guys when I demonstrate something. That's my why. That's what I want out of tennis. I, I am, I'm not Novak Djokovic. I'm not trying to win any big tournaments anymore. Uh, Guy, um, first of all, what do you, do you still love tennis? What, what is your, what is your why uh, when it comes to tennis? What do you mean? What is my why? What is your why? What's your big why? Why, why are you involved in the game still? What do you, what do you want to get into it? Get out I, of I, I, I think there are many reasons. First of all, uh, I'm starting quite young. Um, I, find it, I find it very challenging, uh, very ad addicting, very difficult. Uh, every day you come on court, it's, uh, it's different. You could play your best tennis the day before and next day terrible. Uh, that's something that uh, it's hard to understand and to, to admit. Um, it's a very complete game. I feel like every shot that I hit is different from one to another, uh, and it's very satisfying when 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 you work on 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 something in your game, 
and uh, you actually achieve it. So, um, so that's probably why I'm still playing. Well, I'm, I've been playing all my life. That's the only sport I've played. Uh, so the love of a sport that I cannot explain. And uh, obviously with, with all these very nice players we, we have been watching through the years, uh, this, this uh, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, it's, it's, you know, it gives you even more um, emotions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you want to get back on court after watching these guys and really improve on the game. You know, that's yeah. how many, how many times I've watched a video of, of a Federer hitting a backhand or trying to copy what he's doing or looking at a strategy. Uh, this all, it's, tennis is so complete. It's, it's never ending. You can always get better and, and work, uh, work on, on many, many kind of aspects of the game. So that's probably why I, I'm still, I'm still playing tennis because I still haven't figure out, figure it out. So you're still trying to figure it out, but but so that's a good answer. But you see, like as let's just say I'm going to coach Guy now, I, I would say, well, I don't quite still know why you're you're what what do you want out of the game at this point though? Do you want to play matches still as a coach? Are you not interested in playing matches? Do you want to stay fit? Do you want to learn a new shot? Like what? Even though you love all the challenges of tennis, at this point, realistically. In the next year, with with your demands on coaching, is it just to coach and not play? That could also be your why. Like I, my why is I no longer. The more what I'm trying to get people to understand is the more focused we are with our answer, we can actually get what we want out of it. So I mean, yeah. not everybody has to answer the same thing. Guy's answer could be I still love the game, but I just want to coach. I don't have any desire to play or hit, which is very common with coaches. W what is your why in tennis, though? What do you do? You want to play? Do you want to coach? I want to play and I want to coach. Uh, I think even when I coach somebody, I train myself at the same time, you know. So um, I love coaching, but uh, I also like the, the fun part of it. You know, I, I just I don't want to uh, think that tennis is only coaching and, and work and this is fun. But I, I like the other side of it, of, of competition. Mm. Uh, so and do you want to I like? In, yes, in I like. Yeah. Do you want to compete in tournaments or you just want to compete against friends like like me and you just like let's play a set or do you do you want to get to a level again where you can enter a, a tournament with people at your level or is that no longer of interest to no, you? No, that's that's still that's still on. Uh, then it's, oh. it's 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 the time that you you find to, to manage to work, play in to, in tournament but uh, obviously I'm not uh, aiming to be a professional tennis player but I like the fact that I keep in touch. I think it's important as well when you coach somebody that's even your coach is, is showing uh, that he's in his great shape. You know, I'm he's fully dedicated, and uh, yeah, I, I, I like to think that I I I like I like also thinking that I'm doing that because also I I want to play tennis and I want to I want to compete. So both side of it, playing tennis, competing, and and coaching. So all, all right, aspects. So, of it. so maybe some tournaments are still in there. Okay, so we'll we'll come back to that. Kareem says, I like the friendship and the ability to play well at my age. So he's looking for camaraderie, experiences, and, and just being able to play and hit a good ball, it sounds like, which I think is great. Uh, Doug says, I want to stay fit and spend time with my close friends. Um, what about you, Steve? What What is your why? Uh, why do you, you still go to the court every day, don't you? I, I do play every day. And my why at at my age, almost 78, uh, 78 years old, my why is to basically uh, be an ambassador of the game and and uh, and show uh, the long-term benefits of playing tennis. Uh, um, you know, I, I want to stay fit. And I choose to uh, spend uh, an hour every day on a tennis court uh, to stay fit. Uh, I'm recognizing my limitations uh, after a couple of injuries. And uh, uh, I compete only on a, on a half court basis. Uh, and I do the things that I can do. And I, and I, I, have, a, I have a lot of fun experimenting with different grips, uh, different spins, et cetera, like that. But, uh, but my real why is to say, look, this truly is the sport of a lifetime. At age 78, I can go out here. I can get a great sweat. I can keep myself in shape. Uh, I'm out here with my buddies. We have a good time BSing when we're done. Uh, and, and just the camaraderie of the whole thing. That's yeah, my problem. Yeah, that, that's great. Lisa says, stress and the people are awesome. I, I really think so, too. Great. Great people. Oh, my gosh. Are you, are you guys ready for this? We're ready. This is, 
This is legendary. Ah. Hey, Woody. There you go. I tell you, it it has been a trial and a half getting on to this. Standing ovation for Woody. Way to go. <laughs> uh, a standing ovation for some help that are a little more savvy uh, with the IT than what I am. Well, that see, now I got to say this. This is just an example of how awesome Mark Woodford is because we got to spend time with him in Paris. And one thing that I love is, is he doesn't mail in anything. He uh, was with everybody all the time. And if you think you're going to come onto his court and he's going to take it easy on you just because you, you know, you're, you paid to be there and you're on the court with a legend and you're hoping for some hits and giggles, that's not your style, is it, Mark? Uh, no, <laughs> um, I, I can be a little like that, but I think, uh, um, you know, it, there, there's a time and a place for hitting a giggle and I, I try to really wanted to maximize that time in, in Paris. So, um, you know, some the, I, I think the feedback, you know, is, is pretty quick. Um, you, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, campers were, you know, super excited to actually, you know, kind of get down and, and get dirty on the clay with me. <laughs> that's great so what we're doing here mark just just join we're, we're going through goal setting and we were asking about what everybody's why is why are you still playing tennis before we get into your coaching session yep. you know you look you look pretty fit in paris hitting the ball you you look pretty sharp of course you don't have to be near as sharp as you need to be when you're playing on the pro tour but you obviously still stay in shape and, and play tennis what is your why why do you still like to be involved in tennis and be on the tennis court what what do you hope tennis still brings to your life at this point in your life mm. wow uh, a very layered question um, um i you know what 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 i get out of the uh, out of now when i jump onto the court is at, at the moment uh, for, for this period probably uh, you know since covid as well um you know i needed i needed to get out i needed to be in the fresh air um, and I, I wanted to go out and have a, a nice social hit. Um, you know, obviously, you know, my playing career lasted 18 years and every one, every day that I stepped onto the court was an opportunity to try and improve my game, whether it was physically, mentally, I, there, there was always something to try and, and work on and, and improve that 1%. If I could improve it 5%, if I could, you know, p potentially increase it by 10%. Fantastic. But a positive day was even a 1%. Um, and so I, I just really, um, since retiring, had probably gone through a bit of a roller coaster where, um, you, you know, I, I wasn't always enjoying going on to the court. I had to accept that I'm, I'm not in the same physical shape that I used to be. Um, but my desire to still get out there and, and try and hit the ball cleanly was was really uh, what was taking over. Um, so I just had to tr try and adjust my outlook. And, and really, COVID, in a sense, just allowed me that opportunity to go out onto the practice court um, here in the desert. Um, you know, there's a couple of people that I, I go out and try. I, I was going out and having a hit with, and it was just a social hit. I wasn't out there trying to uh, hit with the, the same power or the same rotation on my forehand. I wasn't trying to necessarily get the perfectly struck backhand slice. Um, I, I wasn't trying to find the target with my volleys. I was just out there for the pure joy of actually having a hit and just trying to get, you know, air into my, into my lungs and just enjoy being outside, which, you know, at the time we, we were all living in a fairly in a very, I should say, restrictive world. So, um, you, you, you know, I, I enjoy getting onto the court now and having a social kit. But as you alluded to with that, at the beginning, there's a time and a place. I, I um, you know, still get to play some legends events. And of course, it's not, I, I, it's not about winning those events. It's, it's probably more about entertaining, but I don't want to look silly on the court. Um, and you were very kind to say about my uh, state in um, in Paris because I've looked at some of those photos and some of the video, and I I look at mine and I'm thinking, 
oh, it was really heavy. <laughs> um, but I had a great time. We, we the had bread and the, and the wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had a great time with you. Okay, now let's get into uh, you back on the tour, though. Let's let's talk, because I think a lot of people can learn about this. It's, you know, so you basically have finished out the year, and now you're looking at the next year, and, and let's even look at you at the top. You know, what what is it like when you are at the top? Is it about trying to stay well, gosh, you know, we're at the top, we've got to keep our level the same, or is it about how do I actually get better? Because if we don't improve, they're going to be after us and start to beat us. Like, what is that feeling as the top dog? And how do you set goals to stay at the top? What is necessary to do that? Yeah, um, it, it probably evolved um, over um, the first couple of years. Once, once the Woodies, Todd and I, you know, reached that uh, that goal of uh, of number one, and um, and and for me, it coincided with the with the time of reaching the number one ranking uh, for the first time uh, myself. So, um, I think that was at the back end of uh, nineteen ninety three, maybe. And um, look, we celebrated big time, and I think our coach at the time probably. Uh, allowed us a period to really enjoy reaching the top of the sport, um, which which not too many get to achieve that. But um, after probably a couple of months, I, I don't think Todd and I, we weren't real, um, uh, we, we didn't have that personalities where we, you know, um, we bragged about reaching number one, um, that we, we weren't outwardly waving our hands, jumping up and down and you know, that we, we were number one, we realized that there was an opportunity to actually, you know, go on for a number of years um, and, and really stay at number one. That that ultimately was the goal. And it was our coach, Ray Ruffles at the time that that put it into a bit of perspective is, as you, as you said, Pete, that there's a target on your back. It happens in singles and it happens in doubles. You all of a sudden become the gauge for your opponent's level of measure of success. They want to kick your butt badly. Um, you, you, a win over you can turn their season around. Um, uh, and so it wasn't for us to actually just rest on our laurels. Um, you know, we felt like we could still climb up the mountain. Um, we wanted to reach the, the absolute peak. Um, and, and we felt that we could keep improving our games. And as long as we we had that desire um, and areas in our game to try and improve, we felt that we could maintain that number one. Um, and you know, probably looking back, you know, we um, through through that decade um, where we were playing, um, you, you know, I think more often than not, we felt at the end of uh, or at the end of the year, um, as we got ready for the next season it was a time to, to look back, reflect, were there areas in our game that needed a bit more attention so that it could stay um, strong through the next 12 months, through the next season. And it would change year to year. It wasn't a repetitive, like my, it wasn't like a forehand every year that needed um, retooling. Um, we it, it, things would change uh, various areas in our game we would pay attention to and um it it really helped us uh, we we believe that we could keep getting better um year after year season after season and and um there was that great desire to try and you know make a name for ourselves a, a piece of history um we we didn't want to be a flash in the pan um, you know, reach number one, win a one or two slams and and that be it. We, we really felt that we could produce um, a bit of a legacy in, in the sport with doubles. So um, that helped drive us uh, year after year as well. That's great. Yeah, you, um, did. <laughs> you sure did. Uh, we're going to answer this question a little bit. I know you've been asking a lot. I just have a couple more questions, Mark, but this is a very important question. You know, how do I play better in tournaments? Any mental things I can do? But before we get into that, so I want to get a little more specific on you would pick out. It wouldn't be the same thing every year. Yep. How would you pick out? And maybe you give, give a specific example. I don't know if you can think back to a certain year or whatever, but 
how would you pick out the one or two things you need to do to get better without overwhelming the entire game and making things too complicated? How mm-hmm. did you decide, okay, this year my first volley has got to be better or my return has got to be better? How did you decide on that? Uh, through consultation, commu- look, Todd, Todd and I, I mean, I, the, the one great asset for us was our communication, our ability, um, which actually thinking now, we don't communicate that well at the moment, but back when we were playing, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> um, when we were playing, um, we communicated very well. We uh, we weren't shy about, you know, um, uh, obviously helping each other um, out and, and recognizing we understood what our strengths and weaknesses were. We, 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 and we communicated with our coach and we communicated with our trainer who, you know, was with us. Um, you know, we made that commitment to them. They gave their trust and their commitment to us as well. Um, so, you, you know, we, we would sit down and, and we would just map out, um, you, you know, not just our schedule, but we were very much aware of in some of those tournaments where we performed well, what what got us over the line? What what helped us win those particular matches and ultimately tournaments? And then we weren't winning every time, um, so we would sit down and and also look at what caused us um, a loss, a defeat. Um, and the beauty of it is we had singles to to worry about. Um, I, I think it's probably important to you know to even. Uh, mentioned that, you know, whilst we were riding this incredible wave uh, of success on the doubles court, singles was always the priority for us. I mean, we considered ourselves tennis players. Um, we grew up um, with with that understanding that we were going to events to play singles and doubles. And if an opportunity arose, we'd play mixed doubles. So we could work on our game on the singles um, and performing well in the singles helped us become even better doubles team uh, and the success on the doubles court really supplemented us on the singles court i mean both todd and i reached the top 20 in singles um, we were semi-finalists of a grand slam uh, in singles so we we were um we were tough players uh, on the singles court absolutely the, the doubles um is what what really just to um uh, the two of us just b- blending into one um, and, and that desire um, to perform. But, you know, we, I think it's important for also to, you know, for any team to recognize what, what wins matches your strengths and what perhaps is a weaker part of your game. So look, uh, for, for us, you know, probably, uh, you know, from memory, our, our serve was um, the vulnerable part, a vulnerable part in our game. Um, I, you know, I was a little taller than Todd, but I certainly didn't have a massive serve. Um, Todd, uh, at times, you know, he would get very streaky with his serve. Yes, he'd he'd get a high percentage of serves into play, but there were moments where, you know, they they weren't landing um, and he didn't have as much margin on the second serve as what I did. So there were times if he got very nervous, um, you know, there would be an array of double faults, um, which is not... I mean, you know, so so some basics that we would um, tinker with was our serve. Um, and because I was a little bit older than Todd as well, five years difference, um, you know, I always wanted to pay attention to how I transitioned to net behind my serve, um, whether it was the first serve or second serve. Um, it wasn't necessarily about trying to sprint to that service line. It was actually trying to arrive for that first volley very well balanced, have a, a a strong base so that no matter the quality of return that was sent out at me, um, I still had the ability, whether it was a half volley, um, whether it was a full volley, whether it was a shoulder high volley. So um, there, there were some basic areas, principles that we would tinker with. But um, I, I think the re- results at times, they give you a pretty good feedback on what you need to be working on. Mm, very good. Okay, we've got a, tur- a tournament player this weekend, Monica. Let's let's start with actually Steve on this. Then we'll go up to Gee, then to Mark. 
and let's let's try and keep the answer to like 30 seconds everybody uh just help her in a tournament because i'm playing tournament saturday any advice on what i could do to mentally prep myself we know when we go in those tournaments we think about it as grand slams how, how do we get our nerves and and be able to focus and play well steve Cantardi. well you know i i believe in keeping it simple and uh, the old football coach in me says you you've got a you've got a game plan and you got a playbook and uh you know what your strengths are and uh if you're uh aware enough maybe you know a little bit about your opponent's game and you know what their weaknesses are and uh you have your game plan accordingly and just like in football uh if you can stick to your plan and cut down your mistakes uh and don't make it too complicated you're going to have a much uh, much better chance of uh calming your nerves because uh, you, you're you're zoned in right there so do what you do well uh, and uh, and just stay focused on it don't make errors Okay, Guy, any advice for her? Yeah, I would just say that uh, me on in my case, I'm just I'm just trying not to think about about what is the what is this match is about, and just trying to have fun. And uh, and I know from you will know from experience that if you stress and uh, and you think about too much about the match, you you're gonna probably lose all your uh, ability. So just relax and uh, and just play as normal as you were playing with a friend. So that's what I'm trying to to do, having fun. Mark, any advice for her? Yeah, I, I mean, look, but supportive of what both Steve and Guy has, have, have just mentioned. And, um, you know, I, I would agree, uh, in particular with Guy's last point there, is, is not, not necessarily to stress um, in, the, in the lead up. I mean, that's the, that's the potential this week is to actually do your work. Um, and, and again, knowing what your game is about and working on it. Probably the day before um, fr Friday tomorrow, probably just rest rest up. Um, you know, not not really stress too much um, about the match. Um, you know, because on game day, all the work should have been completed in the build up before you actually get to that particular tournament time. That's something that Todd and I, you know, really lived and uh, by that at the Grand Slams um, towards the back end of some of the tournaments. You know, we'd see our opponents, they'd be out there practicing up a storm, like, you know, in the quarterfinals or before the semis. And, and you know, Todd and I both, I mean, we'd go and practice, but we weren't out there practicing, you know, for hours. We weren't working on our, our game. It was really just to, um, I guess, tinker so that, you know, we, we were aware all the hard work had been completed already. We just needed to turn up and focus on, our strengths and and implement that and obviously there was some visualization as well that was a, a real bonus see yourself playing the way that your game is set up and of course it's always helpful to see yourself winning that last point shaking hands and eventually holding that trophy yeah that's good all right so here's my advice monica and all the people playing tournaments uh and this seems to work well with kids on the court if they can buy into it uh, and I'm sure it will work well for adults too. And that's to enjoy the challenge of tennis. You know, we, we know that tennis is challenging. We know that it's tough. But then when we get into a tournament and everything, we have this vision of we just want to win 0 and 0. And all of a sudden, if we're down 0 2 or 0 3, that it's not our day and we stink and we can't feel the ball and the match is over. But when you watch, I mean, Rafa comes to mind. You know, he is so good at struggling on the court. And and problem solving. And once you accept that tennis is a problem solving sport and that you enjoy that aspect of it, you're always going to have different problems. You have the problem of being up 3-0 and staying focused. You have the problem of being down 3-0 and, and not quitting. And the more you enjoy that process and not worry about how you're always hitting the ball and if it's your day or not, because most of the day it's not going to, most times it's not going to be completely your day and you do have an opponent, but enjoy that challenge and know that no matter what situation you're in, it's always great practice because you're you're always going to be in great in matches where you're up. You're always going to be in matches where it's even, and you're always going to be in matches when it's down. So whatever the situation is, don't let it ruin your day and think you want to get off the court real quick because it's not going the way you pictured it. Think this is what happens. Enjoy the process. Make the most of it and realize that no matter who you are playing, 
when they get to five games, even if you're down 5-2, to win that sixth game for them is so hard. So make that last game hard no matter what. If you find that you get to where they have five and, and you have less, make that last game a nightmare and enjoy the process of competing. So that's my advice. Great advice, Peter. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I want to go back to Mark Woodford. Mark Woodford, is there truly an art to peaking in the tournaments that you wanted to play well in? Did, did you guys actually – coaches always talk about it, but yeah. did you actually have systems in how, okay, I'm going to gauge my game, and then boom, when this tournament comes, we're flying? Or, or is that not a real thing? We, we believe that there was that an opportunity to peak um, at certain times of the year. Um, you know, it's not, it's not going to happen uh, at, at every major, but I think it, it really, for us, we, we did sit down and we mapped out our, our, our year, our schedule um, together. And, and as I said earlier, with our coach and our trainer, um, and obviously the four slams. I mean, I think we got to a, a certain stage where we knew that we were going to be going deep into some of these tournaments um but going deep wasn't we, we we i mean yes we wanted to be alive in the second week but we believe that we could go you know even further um and, and really hit our hit our stride um in the second week so you know we'd sit down and, and obviously the four slams they were a focus but we added in davis cup um every four years was was the olympics um but then the the other tournaments um, were, were slotted in, um, and I think it is recognition about how long it took um, for you to try and reach that peak. Um, you know, before the Australian Open, you know, we'd give ourselves ample time to come off of the previous season, but in order to come down, you needed to train back up again. So it was you know time in the gym. Uh, and, and then working on the, the, the physical side. And then there was on-court um, uh, training, um, which then the balance of whether, you know, how much time you were on the court as opposed to being in the gym. Um, you know, switching to clay, I was a, a big believer um, that, that because we weren't Australians, we don't have clay courts back home. We have something called something like ant bed or onto car are a couple of names for them. And, but they're just not the same as as traditional European clay. So I always believe that we needed like a longer lead in time to Roland Garros, um, which sometimes didn't always work for us because Todd loved to play in Asia on the faster, quicker, hard courts. That's where he felt his game um, would be enhanced. Um, and so he wasn't necessarily always on board with playing too long in Europe. Um, you know, he he struggled with being in a different culture um, and being away from Australia um, for too long, where I was a bit more, I mean, I had my residence in Monte Carlo for about 10 years. I mean, I didn't mind being over in Europe and uh, with different languages. Um, so, but we, we did try to set ourselves up so that we could ultimately peak um, at the Grand Slams. And I, I think looking back, we probably... Um, we're, we're, we're pretty successful with our with our strike rate once we got to the second week of the Grand Slams. I mean, there were moments that we were beaten by a better team, um, but we trusted our, our training method um, and, and the, the input from our coach and our trainer to really um, help ourselves get into, you know, that uh, uh, almost peak um, cycle. Um, uh, and uh, you, you just you, you just trusted it at, at the very early stage. We obviously were playing, you know, a bit more. But once we got to the top of the game, I think we were a bit more selective of the tournaments that we competed in, so that we could peak. We were we were, didn't want to be playing any of those major tournaments um, if we were uh, fatigued or having overplayed in the lead up to mm. a major event. Mm. Here's a good question from Chris, uh, and maybe we get specific with it, as specific as possible. Um, he says, how do you blend play and then maintain the peak performance? So if you could maybe, you, you, you early in the season, it sounds like it was a lot of, okay, we're going to get back in the gym. We're going to get our bodies back in shape. 
and then we're going to hit the court. But now we're in tournament mode. Yeah. How how many day how many hours would you do some exercise? How much time would you spend hitting a tennis ball, not in a match? And then how much time would you dedicate to the matches where you made money? So if, if you're if, let's talk about the week of the tournament, like it's lean up to the week, and then once you start playing the tournament, um, and just try and be if you can as specific as possible, like the week of. We were in the gym this long. I hit this long, and then we played a practice match or whatever. What did you do? Yeah. So if if, if it was the week before um, a, a tournament that we were really focused on, generally we didn't play. Um, say the week before a Grand Slam, that was for us a, a cycle to 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 almost cycle down um, with with our on court time um, because we were again we we had planned to be it the whole two weeks in Melbourne, in Paris, uh, at Wimbledon, and, and then at, in, in New York um, at, at the US Open. And they're very draining, those tournaments. So, you know, the week before, we didn't play that often um, and, and probably spent a bit more time working with our trainer. Um, uh, and, and, so and how I, long would that be? How long is a session with your trainer? Uh, Look, it, it, uh, cle clearly, when we were in the early part of the season, um, you know, before the Australian Open, it was it was a bit more, uh, you know, in in the gym, and and it depended on whether you know it was strength building or maintaining. Uh, it might be some cardiovascular. Uh, I, I know our trainer, um, Mark Waters, his nickname was Muddy, um, but he would always love us to do a little bit more. I mean, he would prod us and, um, you know, can, can be like five or 10 minutes more of, of, of maybe, you know, one more rep or, you know, uh, legs. And, and uh, you know, we would, uh, it would, it wasn't really a, a battle, but we'd be like, oh, mud, can't, can't we just go back and rest now? So, you know, he took on board our feedback, um, but he needed, when he needed to be strong and get us to, to um, you, you know, spend a little bit more time, perhaps on the court. You know, it varied. Cardiovascular. It wasn't just about being on the treadmill. It wasn't just about being on a bike, a stationary bike, um, or or a versa climber. Um, you, you know, we'd go out onto a field, um, and, and we would kick a soccer ball around. So it would be a combination of actually trying to do a variety of sports. So we we would get enjoyment from it. Um, we'd bring an Aussie rules football. We'd even take a frisbee, but you could just, you know, you are in an open field. So it was hand-eye coordination, um, very similar to what you would do, be, what we'd all be doing on the tennis court. Um, but you could pit against each other. We, we'd bring in some of the other Australian players that were at the tournament to, you know, kick a, the soccer ball, which not, not too many of us in Australia were, were that great. Um, <laughs> kicking the, the soccer ball, we, we were much happier when the when Muddy brought out the Aussie rules footy. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but the you know it was it was always designed so that it never became uh, old hat for us. Yeah. Um, it, you know, yeah. It it really had to you know keep us uh, you, you know light and 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 uh, I guess content that we were working on our cardiovascular. Um, but but court time was probably limited um, because once again that that work should already have been completed probably within the last few days of before a Grand Slam started. I think, you know, we would then focus more on playing points, whether it was the singles. Again, priority was the singles. So you'd, we'd be out there playing sets. Um, and, and we just, uh, if, if we got bundled out early in the singles, um, then those days might switch a little bit more to some doubles practice. But the doubles, whenever we got out there, we never tried to labour too much. Um, you, you know, at Davis Cup, yes, there were times we would turn up and, um, you know, we might we might have learned that Pat Rafter or Leighton Hewitt, Mark Philippoussis or Jason Stoltenberg, that, that uh, John Newcomb and Tony Roach might have been prepared to pick them ahead of Todd and I in the singles. So Todd and I would then spend probably a couple of hours a day working on our skills on the doubles court but we that was only on those occasions when we were aware ahead of time when we turned up that we were playing doubles um so it it would you know look clay when you're when you're getting ready for the european swing you do want to spend more time on the tennis court because you've got to be ready for those longer 
rallies and, and longer matches that um, I, I think highlight what, what clay court tennis is about. It pushes yeah. you emotionally and physically. Um, and, and then once the grass came around, um, I, I mean, everything was just a lot tighter, more succinct. Um, we were doing very fast twitch reactionary work on and off the court. I mean, points on grass, on real grass, you know, they don't they don't go on for long periods of time. So, you know, all of our training was about hitting shots, three or four shots, um, very quick movement. Um, uh, and, and then once that once the grass court season finished, then it was, you know, you know, rest time, but start to get ready for the the second part of the year. By then you're obviously a bit more fatigued, but that's the investment that you make at the early part of the year that it starts to pay off in the second part of the season. Very cool. Um, let's talk about you're in the middle of the year, so you're a little tired, and and let's just go – let's not even go what you were doing. Let's just go hours so we can make this a real quick answer. The the week of you're, – you're not playing too much, but you're exercising. How many hours is that? I know your coach is always changing how hard he's working with you, but is he making you go four hours – three hours, one hour? Is he varying it from day to day? What would be the longest and what would be the norm? In the, in the second part of the year, um, I, I, some occasionally it, what would be determined is some of the results leading in. And if we, there was a bit of a trough, um, certainly in singles, um, he might have had us on the court a little longer. Um, you know, four hours was probably a little extreme as you're heading into the second <laughs> part of the season. Um, um probably should say that yes we were practicing five hours a day but, no, but not, no. I, th I think it was it, it well it was probably around the two to three hour three hour three maximum. Three hour. um and and then there would be you know uh, supplemented by um you know some some footwork uh, it might be doing some more cardiovascular and, and of course if there were any you know areas on our body um you know paid attention to our shoulders um uh, to our core, obviously the core is what, you know, um, everything is connected with, with your core. Um, so, you know, we, we were always paying attention um, to, to making sure that the season, we could finish the season and that we could finish playing approximately 100 matches um, right. combined in, in singles and doubles. That was our, our goal that we would set as well. We felt it was a, a very productive season if we could hit a hundred matches. But um, yeah, it, I think in the second half of the year, look, if we if we went over the three hour mark on the tennis court, that means we were probably playing pretty poorly. We were going through a bit of a bad patch, and uh, yeah. you know, Ruff was having to kick us in the butt. <laughs> okay, we got we got some more questions, and we're going to start with Steve, then go to Guy, then go to to Mark. Because uh, I think these are great questions. And I know that they love hearing about the pro stuff, but they also want to win their matches. Yeah, of and course. And they're the most important ones. So yeah. um, here's a question from Rich. I'm going to leave this to the legend to start out. Do you play pressure points differently, Steve? Do you coach your players to play pressure points differently? Or do you try and tell them to play every point like it's the last point, like Rafa does it? Well, I mean that that's that's ideal, but the truth of the matter is there are points that are that are more important, and when you've got that advantage, okay, then you've got to you've got to really stay focused, and uh, you're not going to take too many chances. But by the same token, you're not going to play too conservative either. Uh, you gotta you, you know you you gotta you still have to play to win. You can't play to you know just maintain. There's no there's no uh, there's no clock in tennis, so you've got to, you've got to cross the finish line. So. Yeah, I do think when there's a pressure point, you got to that, that comes from the guts, that comes from the heart. You just have to have the, you know, the the uh, the confidence to go out and, and and do what you can do, and don't be bashful about it. Yeah, Guy, what about you, bud? What do you think? No, I would say that um, I will. Uh, as I said, I'm I'm just trying to do what I know, what I can do. I'm just not trying to to make up something new. Uh, obviously, I'm not trying to hit the ball as hard as I can, but uh, I'm trying to be confident, patient, and uh, and find the right opportunity to to finish it. You know, so I in this kind of point, you know, my my for example, my strength was the was the maybe the the return the return and uh, and going to the net or serve and, and going to the net. So I was usually trying to 
to come to the net as, as soon as possible because I knew that my opponent also was feeling some pressure. So showing him that I was, you know, I'm large, big, and I'm coming to the net, he's, you know, he's getting scared and he's trying to make a move. So I don't know. Pretty much what I would say, like making making pressure and try to get some, some try to get in the court and, and finish up to the net. If you feel comfortable that, with the net, obviously, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What What about you, Woody? What What about pressure points? How, how, do you yeah. treat them differently? I, I, you know, I, I, I really endorse what Gome said. Um, <laughs> uh, and and Richard Wallace should remember. Uh, you, you know, upon discussion, I know that he's been at uh, that the camp before. He's clearly forgotten Steve. You, you know, some of our tips that we've uh, uh, helped him with over time. Um, but yeah, it, first is to be aware that it is a pressure point. It's a key a key moment in the match. And I, I, I endorse what Guy was talking about. That you know, you don't in those pressure moments. You have to re if you're recognizing that it is a big moment. The other person at the other end is probably it's it's hitting it's it's alarm bells are going off up their end of the court, and it and it's the same with recognize if you're nervous, your opponent or or opponent is going to be nervous as well, and in that it, it sense, you don't want to play those big moments um, by using the weaker part of your game, and I think it goes back into what we alluded to before, is being cognizant, aware of what your strengths are. And what your weaknesses are and in those big key moments as Guy said you know being six foot five and uh um you know uh, serve that uh, comes from great height you want to use your presence you want to get to net in those scenarios um you, you know for me uh those those big moments I, I wanted to if it was on the doubles court i wanted to try and you know get a forehand return because i could impart so much more spin and accuracy off of that side. Um, if the point evolved, yes, I, my goal was to try and get to net because part of my um, weapons were getting to the volley and anticipation up at net. And, and I had to accept that I wasn't always going to come out on top, but I was going to try and give myself that best chance of winning those pressure points by using my weapons in my game. Yeah. So if you guys are listening, I think they, they've all kind of said some really important things, which is do what is most comfortable in your game on pressure points, what you're best at and what your strengths are. So I have an exercise for everybody because I think a lot of you still don't quite know what that is, you know. And so what I want you to do is to imagine go go to the practice court this weekend with a basket of serves. And imagine that you've got your full team on the side of you and you've got to make one serve. You can't tap it in. You know, what is your go-to serve? Are you going down the middle slice? Are you going out wide? Are you kicking it? Know what, if somebody said you've got this one shot to hit right now, that you would know exactly what you'd pick and where you'd hit it. The more you know that about every stroke in your game, you're going to be able to bring that out without thinking under pressure, at, at least as, you know, not getting overwhelmed. Like if you don't know what you're going to do, then it gets worse and worse. But if at least you kind of know like, okay, big pressure point. I want to hit this shot there. If it comes to this side, then you can play more like you want to play under pressure. So start to develop every aspect of your stroke, just knowing, okay, I've got one shot. Everybody's watching. Where am I hitting it? And get better and better at your most comfortable strength. That's, that's my advice right there. Um, Good. We've been on almost an hour, and I, first of all, Mark called me earlier saying that he's under the weather and he doesn't know if he could talk, and the guy brought it tonight for us. I mean, <laughs> that's just what kind of an awesome guy is, and that's what kind of a great time we all have. And uh, you're like being, I was saying, you're being way, to... way too nice. I I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I I was like beside myself that I couldn't log in. Uh... I know well, that that says a lot about you too, but but but. You know, I was saying my why before you got on Woody is, is my why is the experience of tennis. What, what I get from the experiences and, and, and being in Paris last year was the best week, the best vacation I ever had in my life. I, I, I told people that before Paris, I was excited, but I didn't quite know what I was getting into because I always thought when I want to go on vacation, I usually want to be on a beach. Like I didn't, I don't think of cities, but when I went to Paris, 
I was blown away. I had never seen a place like that ever in my life. Paris is incredible. I've never been there. And that we're playing on the French open courts, that we have a legend like Mark Woodford with us, that we have everybody who loves tennis with us, that we're going out to these amazing, beautiful restaurants with just awesome meals, four or five course meals everywhere we're going, being in our own boat, going by the Eiffel Tower, then going out to Lyon. Like it just never stopped. Like every time I thought, oh, well, that's the best day of my life. The next day I'd wake up and it'd be better. So if, yeah. if, Guy, if you could kind of take it away and explain how we can join you next year in Paris, and uh, we'll put the link in here too. If you, if you guys are interested and you guys feel free to um, email me or whatever, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to get on the phone with you. But, well, uh, we, we, take it yeah. away. well, thanks Pete. Well, actually we, yeah, we have a website. I'm sure you can uh, maybe share the, the link. I'm and through this link, now. yeah, yes. and through this link, you will uh, you will actually uh, get on the landing page and, and see a video actually of a trip. It's like 40, 40 second videos that you're gonna see uh, some of the the highlights of the trip, and uh, and if you scroll down, you will have all the details of uh, every single day that you will spend uh, in France. So it's gonna be four days in Paris. You're gonna plan the French Open. You will stay in the five-star hotel, which is actually across the street from the, the Roland Garros stadiums. Uh, we're going to have some nice meals. And uh, and at the end of the trip in Paris, we will have a, a dinner cruise, private dinner cruise uh, with the Bastille days, uh, fireworks. It was awesome uh, this year, actually. We, we just had the, the boat right parking in front of the Eiffel Tower. And we had a, a nice dinner with some, some champagne. And, uh, and the next day, we go to Lyon. Lyon is... a uh, is a, is a city where I'm from. Actually, is a, is a, they call it the stomach of France because uh, we have so many good restaurants and uh, so many chefs uh, that are very famous worldwide, like Paul Bocuse. And uh, we will bring you to very nice uh, restaurants and enjoy some great typical French food. Uh, and uh, and we'll do some some of you see some tennis in a, in a, in one of the oldest uh, clubs in in, uh, in Lyon. In, in France with Mark, uh, you, Pete, and Steve. And uh, also we'll uh, finish up with a, with a wine tour. So yeah. yeah, get on this link and you will get all details. You have a registration form and uh, you can contact uh, either me or Steve for, for joining us. It's going to be from the 11th to the 18th of July. Yes, it, it is really awesome. Guys, I put the link. You guys should be able to see the link in the chat. And I, I also put it up here on the screen. And I'm telling you, even if you're not planning on going, just go to the page and look at everything we do. When, when I first looked at everything we are going to do last year, when I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is amazing. But it turned out even better than the page. The page is mouthwatering. The video is amazing. But when you go, it's even better. I'm telling you, it is even better. It's, a, it's amazing. Mark, now you've done... A lot of it. You've been all over the world. Every time Steve Kintari is talking about getting in touch with Mark Woodford, he's in this country, he's in that country, he's going here, he's going there. So how did this week stack up for you uh, in the experience of, of what you've done in your life? Well, I've, I've been a part of the, the fantasy camps in, in Texas for, um, it's 20 years now, isn't it, uh, Steve? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. the camp has been running for 35 years itself, but uh, I... I was invited along the year after I retired. I think I've missed two of them uh, due to work commitments, um, other work commitments, I should say. And uh, um, that was like pulling teeth, um, that the fact that I couldn't be there that uh, those particular weeks. But with all sincerity, it's the, the best week that I do. Um, and I have done a few different camps along the way. Um, so I was excited to be invited along by Guy and Steve um, this year uh, in Paris. Um, I, you know, the week after Wimbledon, I was already over there. Um, you, you know, having to flee the centre court of Wimbledon, I was uh, sitting in the Royal Box on uh, men's final day, um, caught the Eurostar across in order to be ready for our 9am call on the Monday. Um, so I expected everything to be in order it was it blew me away 
um, I, I had the best time. And I think if uh, if we're all having a, a great time, it really does translate to a lot of the guests, you know, who are there and participating. Um, I, I, I just thought it was sensational to be able to play on the match courts of Roland Garros, where, where I've played uh, many years ago. Um, and I'm commentating. I, I still work at Roland Garros as one of the, the main commentators for the world feed. So to actually go back at that time of the year, it's quite exceptional. It, it blew me away. And I hope that uh, there'll be, you, you know, some people, uh, you know, from today's event that will want to sign up and come and join us because uh, Steve and Guy do an amazing job. Steve Cattardi, the legend, will let you have the last word. Well, you know, it's uh, for me, when we walked on to those red clay courts at Roland Garros, uh, I just couldn't stop smiling. I just have to pinch myself and say, we are actually playing at Roland Garros. Uh, it was it was really, really very, very uh, special. And uh, uh, it, it just, uh, it, I, I just get excited right now thinking about it. So you know, all the other things were, were frosting on the cake and, and, and they were absolutely spectacular. Uh, I probably had uh, a half a dozen people tell me that uh, uh, that Thursday over there was the best day of their life. They played tennis at Roland Garros. Uh, they had lunch in a president's box overlooking uh, the center court. They had pictures taken on the stadium court. Then they had a dinner cruise. Then they parked under the Eiffel Tower and watched the uh, fireworks of Bastille Day. They said this is the best day of their life. And then like you said, and the next day they said, well, this might be the best day. So it was, uh, it was just absolutely thrilling. It was beyond... Uh, what I expected, quite frankly, when Guy and I put the thing together. So uh, very special trip. And for one couple, it was even more exceptional. So if anyone does want to get married, I think we can we can manage that. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. We had a wedding. We had a wedding on a dinner cruise. That's exactly right. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and, and I would add one other thing. The uh, the the people, the the people that accompanied us on this trip were they just were all in the same mode of of loving tennis loving people and they were there to have a good time and and, and the people really made it very special yeah, yeah i i want to piggyback on the people thing because one thing you know i do a lot of work now with people coming to visit me here in cincinnati in paris and the thing that blows me away about everybody is you think oh man they're they're coming they're they're coming from all over they're spending good money might be kind of high maintenance people the thing about tennis people that, that a lot of people don't understand, they just love tennis. And they just love being around people who love tennis. It is such a great, easygoing group of people who are just happy to be out with each other, spending time with each other, spending, you know, creating memories together, being on a tennis court, and then seeing the most beautiful sights in the world. And I think everybody the whole week was just grateful to spend time with each other and, and be able to share those experiences. And that, that's what I am always blown away by. Cause you're always nervous that you're going to have people be upset with this and upset with that. That doesn't go right. But everybody becomes a team and we all just uh, have a great time together. Even if everything doesn't go perfectly, but on that trip, honestly, everybody, everything did. So um, it's pretty awesome. So I, I hope you guys look at that link, even if you don't think you're going to come, do yourself a favor and look at the link. So maybe if you don't make it this next year, you'll make it at some point in your life. Because once you come, you're going to want to keep coming back. And uh, I want to thank everybody for their time tonight. Uh, again, you're totally obsessed if you're on with us at 910, talking about goal setting for tennis. There's something special about you, and we appreciate you. Any any uh, final words, guys, that you want to say uh, good night? Mark? Uh, bonsoir. Uh, <laughs> you you said my word. <laughs> get, get some, uh, get some nightclub. And 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 a tout à l'heure, isn't that uh, somewhat uh, correct, there, Guillaume? Tout à l'heure, tout à l'heure, is see you later. That's but right. bonsoir is it was it was better. It's yeah. like good okay. night and okay. Yeah. We'll see everyone in uh, at Roland Garros. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. See you in Paris. Guy, Guy, any 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 parting uh, things you'd like to say? Well, uh, à bientôt, au revoir, and uh, I hopefully see you uh, in France to practice on, on your tennis and French with all of you guys. <laughs> Steve, legend. 
Well, what I always tell everybody when I sign off, I say, keep playing and enjoying and make sure to play a few sets this weekend. It's a fabulous game. It keeps us all going. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate Guy's time, Steve's time, Mark's time, and most importantly, everybody who is on with us tonight. And uh, thanks for your patience as we got the legend on, which was really cool. Mark Woodford, thanks for <laughs> grinding that out and getting another win. And, Take and care, Peter, guys. Peter, thank you for uh, thank you being yeah. the master of ceremonies here. Great, great program. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Guys. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Everybody Steve. Have a great night. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.